Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back. We got some more bite-sized business advice for you. And we have an episode that probably nobody wants to hear, but really, really important to talk about this topic. Take it from me, from personal experience. You're going to want to be prepared. We're talking about legal issues that come up in business. What should we be thinking about? What should we be protected from? And why should we prioritize this kind of stuff in our day-to-day business life? So I have a business attorney with me, Matthew Fornaro. Before we go any further, Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. So it's uh, it's a topic nobody wants to think about until we have to think about it. But in most cases, that's probably a little bit too late. Um, so tell me, before we get into this, um, business attorney, uh, business and commercial litigation, how long have you been been doing this? Uh, for about 21 years now. So you've seen some stuff. Is it fair I've to seen say? Some, yeah, I've seen some stuff. Okay. So I want to unpack. I want to kind of help our audience figure out what are the things we need to be thinking about in advance? Like what are the most common pitfalls when it comes to business litigation and, and being secure legally in your business? So let's, let's kind of st- just say over the course of your 21 years, what are, what are the common things that seem to keep coming up that you wish maybe business owners are more prepared for? You know, there's a lot of different things I've seen, but there's a lot of similar things I've seen over the, I guess, two decades that I've been doing this. And I guess the ultimate breakdown, most simple thing to tell your audience is you have to comply with formalities and you have to have contracts. And if you take anything away from this episode, that's it. All right. Should we wrap up right there? I mean, that's that's Yeah, that's it. That's what we're done. (laughs) That's, Let's move on. You want, it, you want it bite size? That's bite size, right? That's there. bite size. Yeah. Okay. We'll clip that. If you have thirty seconds, you listen to that. If you have more than that, you listen to the whole episode. Um, so yeah, no. Let, I want to unpack that too because um, that's. I'll, I'll just share. It's it's public knowledge at this point. So I I sold my last business um, last year. Ended up the the owner the new owner did not understand what she was getting into and uh, didn't properly review what that business was. Decided wasn't for her tried to sue me to get, I don't know, money out of it. Um, but we had a rock solid contract because I invested in a really good lawyer and this is just going to cost me some money, be a blip in the radar, but it's not really going to affect me. So let's talk about setting up a contract, investing in a good lawyer. It, it could be a contract for anything, selling a business, uh, a deal between two parties. What do you look for or what is, what's really important to you when you're working with a client and setting up a contract like what's what are some of the basic foundational pieces that need to be in place so you know your clients protected from anything that could come at them well let's start you know there's obviously there's you know many types of contracts let's start at the very basics so let's say when a when someone when a client comes to me and wants to actually start a business okay so when you start a business obviously it's not a hobby it's an actual real thing that you have to comply with formalities and stuff with. So if it's a corporation, we need to have articles of incorporation and corporate bylaws that you then follow under whatever state you're in law um, in order to properly run your business. Or if it's an LLC, then it's a uh, operating agreement that we need to come up with that then you follow when you actually run your business. So that's the very foundation of when you start a business and when you do something is you have to have your governing documents in place. And some states actually require you to have to file those. Some states don't. Um, Where I am, you don't have to file them in Florida, but in other states you do have to file them. But regardless of where you are, if you're going into business, you need to have those documents because if you're ever gonna, like in your situation, get sued, or if you're ever gonna have to take out a loan or if you're ever going to want to sell your business or merge with another business, if you don't have those basic documents, you're not going to be able to do anything. So those would be the very basic first type of documents and contracts that I would 
talk to a client about or discuss would be the foundational um, contracts for starting a business. Then obviously you go from there with all your contracts, whether it's you, you know, have employment contracts, whether you have contracts when you buy or sell something, you have contracts when you license something, just making sure whatever it is you do in your business, make sure you have contracts for it. And as part of your business, just like how I encourage all my clients to have an accountant, if you need any, if there's one thing you have at all, I would always say have an accountant. But the second thing is always have a business law attorney because you are going to be faced with legal issues at some point in your business. And you're going to need someone who can help you and guide you through the process in order to be able to um, navigate any problems or deal with any issues. Yeah, that, that's good advice. And I'm, I'm also curious about going back to those, the articles of, of formation, the operating agreement, stuff like that. We hear about this stuff from uh, like legal zoom or just these like one click online websites. Can you explain to me the difference when you're working with a client one-on-one -on -one versus going to a website like that? Like what's, what's the real benefit from working with um, an individual attorney and not just some website out there? Sure. I mean, we can even go lower than that. I mean, we can just go to finding something off the internet without even having to pay for legal zoom versus paying for legal zoom versus paying for an attorney. So obviously, you know, as part of your setting up a business, doing things, you have to budget things accordingly. And like I said, you have to budget for legal expenses because it's a very part, important part of your business and the foundation of your business. Now, if you can't afford an attorney, obviously like a legal zoom or a document preparing service like that is better than trying to do it yourself or just figure it out off the internet. But if you can afford an attorney, which you should be able to, because it should be part of your business plan, the attorney is able to tailor make those documents for you regarding your specific business needs, your business plan, you personally, your personal finances, and whatever jurisdiction you're in. Whereas if you go on like a legal Zoom or something, yeah, you specify the state you're in or you specify the county in the state you're in. And then the, you know, the document maker just makes documents for a word, like for instance, I'm in Broward County, Florida. So it would make Broward County, Florida documents. And that's it. That's as subjective as it gets versus tailoring it to your specific needs and making sure that's exactly what you need to get your business started or do whatever for your business. And what's the benefit of that too? Like that, does that impact your eligibility to get loans or um, work with certain maybe governments? What's, what's the long-term impact of setting it up correctly? Yeah, it's better to have the custom made documents because they're more thorough, they're more bespoke, they're more, um, on point as far as going forward. So if like in your situation where you have someone who sues you later on, your documents are gonna be generally better if an attorney drafts them. If you need to go get a loan or you need to um, you know, buy something or do something, having more customized documents is better than just having generic documents because it says more about you, it says more about your business and it outlines more things that a prospective third party or someone who's looking at you would want to know about your business. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm curious, is there a particular area of business where you see the the highest rate of litigation? And I, I guess what I'll, let me give you some examples. Uh, well, we gave you my example of selling a business. I'm sure that mm -hmm. happens a number of times. Um, another one that comes to mind would be potential employee litigation, disagreements mm -hmm. between employer employees. Is there anything that seems to pop up for you more frequently? You know, a lot of different things pop up because there's just a lot of business issues and litigation in general. I mean, obviously, employment stuff is huge. I mean, people not getting paid, people violating non-disclosure agreements, people violating non-compete agreements is huge in business because it just happens. As far as businesses go, there's always issues with performance under contracts, whether the other party didn't provide you the services or the goods or didn't pay you for your goods or your services. And, um, you know, it's just the, the normal cycle of things that happen in a business, no matter how well you run it or how well prepared you are. Those are, you know, things that just happen all the time in business. 
Yeah, that that's an interesting one to me is, you know, you're dealing with a client or a customer and they decide not to pay. We, we tend to think that an invoice is a form of a contract, which it is, but how, how hard is it to uh, have that be upheld? Should you have to go to court or some sort of a litigation? What, what should we really be having in place? And I'm sure it varies by the dollar amount and the nature of the business, but can you give me some best practices as far as kind of protecting your income, if you will? Sure. I mean, for an invoice, obviously, um, you know, your invoice, like you said, is a contract. So you should try to make it as robust as possible. You should have definite terms in there as far as who does what, who pays what, when it's done, how it's done, what happens if someone doesn't do it. You should have a venue provision in case there's a lawsuit that says it's in whatever venue, um, you know, you're located in whatever venue you want it to be. You should have an attorney's fee provision that says the prevailing party is entitled to their attorney's fees. And it should be as robust as possible. I mean, I see a lot of people who give out invoices and it's, you know, it's just like, here, pay me for services rendered. And there's so much more that we put into an invoice to make it a better enforceable contract that then if something goes wrong, it's a lot easier to try to enforce and try to get your money or get your goods or get your services than if you were just hand like a one pager and say, you know, pay me. Yeah, that's uh, or or a handwritten note on a piece of paper. I'm yeah. sure those hold up really well in court. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's yeah, that's interesting. So now, I'm um, I'm also curious because a as you're talking, I'm just thinking of more and more rabbit holes that we could obviously go down. I used to meet with my uh, CPA. As a matter of fact, I still do. Um, I meet with her once a month um, to just review the numbers. She sends me the the big three, right? The balance sheet, statement of cash flows, P and L and just gives me basically the update on the company because I do not specialize in accounting. As we're having this conversation, I'm thinking, huh, you should probably also meet with an attorney pretty frequently just to go over maybe what's going on in the business, review employment contracts, review supplier contracts, whatever. Do you have, uh, whether it's on retainer or just a flat fee over the course of the year, how often do you recommend meeting with your attorney to just see what's going on? Well, that's a good point. I mean, you should meet regularly with them, like how you meet with your accountant regularly. Obviously, anytime you do anything big or make any changes or want to make any changes, I mean, that's a reason to meet with your attorney, whether it's you're going to buy something big, sell something big, you're going to hire new people, you're going to fire people, you're going to, um, you know, take out a loan or do something. I mean, those are all reasons. Anytime there's like an event, that's a big, not even a big event, a moderate size to whatever event you want to meet with your attorney. In addition to, you know, it's good quarterly or biannually, whatever you can do. So just check in with your attorney and go over things and tell them how the business is going, what you've seen, what's going on. Because you can kind of proactively try to avoid issues and try to confront issues that you're sort of, sort of seeing in the uh at their inception versus coming afterwards and being like, Oh, well, we could have caught that if you would have came earlier. Hmm. Yeah, no, that that's, I think kind of what I said at the beginning, right? When we, when we have to reach out to an attorney, it's often it's too late and the issue could have probably been prevented in most cases, or at least you could have had a contract or something in place that, that would have protected you more. So uh, yeah, being proactive, I think is, is what I've learned re relatively recently, but um, I'm also thankful I learned that lesson too. Let's talk about real quick. Um, and then I want to ask you just a ridiculous question. So let me seed the question. I want to hear over the last 21 years, the most ridiculous case you've been a part of. So while you think about that, you can answer this next question. Okay. The exiting of a business. We I shared my story. What are some things that we should be thinking about when exiting a business to protect both sides? Really? I mean, we want to make sure that the new seller has everything they need to run a successful business and keep it going. Nobody wants the business to fail. Um, but you also want to make sure as the seller, you're fully protected. So you don't find yourself in my shoes, wasting a boatload of money for no, absolutely no reason. Um, so what are some things that you like to look at or, or have in place in that exiting contract? Sure. You want to make sure before you even get to the exit part that you have the parts in your uh, toolbox that are supposed to go with the business. So for instance, if you're selling or exiting like a corporation, you want to make sure, like I said, there's articles of incorporation bylaws. 
you have employees, employee contracts, things like that, same thing with an LLC. You want to make sure you have an operating agreement. And, you know, if you have vendors, you have vendor contracts. If you have a lease, you have a written lease. You want to make sure all that stuff's in place before you even get to the part where you then sell the business or transfer the business. And when you sell or transfer the business, you want to make sure that you have a very robust and well thought out um, sales document, however you want to characterize the sales document, whether it's a stock sale, a membership certificate sale, an asset purchase, whatever. You want to make sure that it's very well thought out, has things that I talked about a little while ago, like venue provision, attorney seat provision. It has default provisions. It specifies exactly what's done in order to transfer the business from one uh, person to another. Like if there's a lease, who has to go deal with the landlord and get consent for the lease? If there's bank accounts, who does what to transfer the bank accounts? So you want to make sure all that stuff's in order in order to properly transfer a business. So you want to make sure the foundation documents are there. You want to make sure the foundation process is there. You want to make sure all the transfer documents are there. And you want to make sure that you're in touch, obviously, with the opposing or not the opposing side, but the buyer, the seller, the other side, their attorneys, their accountants, to make sure that everything is done as smoothly as possible. So that would be my advice for the uh, transfer issue. Yeah, and all of that, I mean, if you think about it in advance, you work with an attorney in advance and say, I'm thinking about selling. What do I need? Having all that stuff in place makes your life easier through the process of that sale too, whether you're um, the buyer or the seller, just knowing what to expect in advance, what to ask for. Those are the really important questions um, to, to be prepared for, in my opinion. So Matthew, I'm curious. I seeded the question. I, I have to know everybody likes a good story, a good horror story, if you will. Um, give me give me like one of the most ridiculous uh, cases that comes to mind over the past 21 years for you. Um, you know, I've been fortunate that I've had so many bizarre cases that I don't even know. It does things that other people would think, wow, that's really weird, man. And I'm just like, that's that's Tuesday, man. That's not yeah. weird. Um, so I would say, I don't know, earlier on in my career, I would say something that was pretty weird was we sued a electronic medical records company. This was back when electronic medical records were very cutting edge and not like industry standards. This was like, this was probably 2005. So this was new technology. So the doctor who invented the uh, technology company essentially um, took a lot of money and uh, held people's medical records hostage and wouldn't give them to doctors unless they paid him more money and do whatever. So we wound up suing the doctor individually, the doctor's business, and the um, the doctor's spouse and everything, and we got judgments against them. So the in order to try to thwart my um, collection efforts, the doctor actually changed their their gender identity from uh, from a woman to a man in order to throw off the uh collection efforts wow that's crazy. and that was that was you know this is 2005 before this was like a really you know before this is a topic that's more dealt with in society and more commonplace now that was very is very interesting because the person would try to claim that they weren't the same person and all kinds of crazy stuff and then also in that same case i had uh the doctor's co-defendant stole this is back before everything was online so there were actual court files the doctors uh the doctor's uh, co-defendant stole um the court file checked it out and stole it so that all the records disappeared so i had to regenerate the court file and reconstruct it so that was also interesting in the same case i also had in the same case too my opposing counsel who has since passed away, who I love this guy because he's such a uh, such an interesting, he's probably the most interesting attorney I ever met in my life. He literally faked a car accident to get out of a deposition once. In, in this same case, he faked a car accident. 
And then also we had a hearing where very bad things were gonna happen to the doctor and his co-defendants. And this attorney started crying on cue and started bringing up his divorce and was like inconsolable so that the judge ruled in his favor. So that's all in one case. So that would probably be my most interesting thing that happened. It's all in one case. And it was early on in my career. Yeah, I'm sorry. That might be a Tuesday for you, but that's completely ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's that awesome. was that's still at the forefront of things. But once once that bar was set that high early on in my career, that's why other things don't really phase me or bother me. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, that's really funny. Yeah, the, the things people do to avoid avoid just the truth and doing what's right. It always amazes me, but um, this has been really insightful. And, and I think really it's an important conversation that a lot of people need to hear because you don't want to get caught on the backside of something, whether that's just a simple customer's not paying your invoice or you actually find yourself with a lawsuit. So uh, Matthew, thank you for coming. I put your website on the screen here. Um, you can go check that out if you want to learn more about Matthew's firm and, and what they do. If you're in Florida, uh, it probably applies to you more than, than the rest of us. But um, I am curious, can you give us like a quick little tip? This is probably the most important thing. I, I wish I had this information in advance. What are some really important questions to ask a lawyer before we wrap up here um, when selecting one? Because a good lawyer can make your day. A bad one can really ruin the rest of your life in most cases. No, so just, what are some questions we can ask? Just ask what their experiences in the area that you want to hire them in. And then do, before you even inquire them, do your due diligence and do a Google search of the attorney and see what legitimate reviews are out there and legitimate items are out there about the attorney before you meet with them. That's awesome. And see if they've uh, ever put on a show in a courtroom to get out of a deposition. That's always, mm -hmm. that's, that might be a good filter for you. Yeah. Matthew, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. For those of you watching and listening, wherever you are, take this stuff seriously. Please take my advice here. Get in front of it. Have a lawyer who's an attorney you can talk to in your business to make really good educated decisions. And of course, subscribe to this show because we bring you amazing guests like this. We have the conversations that you probably aren't thinking about, but you should have and you should be thinking about in order to grow your business and get it to the next level. So make sure you subscribe. We'll see you on the next episode of Harmonious at Lunch. And thanks for listening.